Good, yeah, so um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come to this beautiful place and to present uh, an overview about uh, what we call the Swiss Muon source, um, the Muon facilities, which, uh, or let's say this is the hardware that you need to produce all these nice results that you could already see today in the morning talks and also now in, in the battery talk. Um, so I will briefly give you an overview of how we generate these muons at such facilities and also how to generate these low energy muons or ultra slow muons in the kilo electron volt range, which was a few times mentioned. Uh, very briefly, uh, oops, um, it's just, I say some general words about MUSE applications in, in condensed matter research. We saw already many examples today. And then I will give you an overview about the instrumentation at, at the facility. So we heard uh, today already you, you need a proton accelerator to generate pions and you use then the pions decaying into the muons um, in, in this reaction here and uh, the lifetime of the pions is about 26 nanoseconds. It's a parity violated decay. So the pion is a spin zero particle, the, uh, it decays into spin one half particles and the spin of the or the helicity of the neutrino is fixed because of the parity violation. There's only one kind of neutrino, so the spin point's always opposite to its momentum. So th therefore the spin of the muon has also to point opposite to its momentum in this two-body decay, which gives you 100% polarization. And in the rest frame of the pion, uh, the energy of the muon would be around 4 MeV. So how to produce them? Yeah, in these nuclear reactions, but um, the energy, so you have to first provide the energy of the pion, 140 MeV, but since it's, this is a fixed target um, collision, the kinematic threshold is around 300 MeV. You see here the production cross-section of the pions, it's steeply increasing, and we have the two uh, cyclotron facilities, Triumph and PSI, running at around 5 to 600 MeV, and then synchrotrons providing pulse beams in the GeV range at ICES and JPARC. So, but I will not talk about the advantages, disadvantages of using DC or um, pulsed uh, beams. So yeah, the cyclotrons, uh, these are typically 50 megahertz machines, which is in the range of the lifetime of, of the pion. So the, 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 the time structure and the muon beam of the accelerator will be smeared out usually at these uh, machines. So this we saw already a few times, we have four big facilities in the world. Two DC, uh, or two DC beam facilities, Triumph and PSI, pulse machines at the ICS and J-Park. Um, we have energy ranges from the kilo electron volt up to 100 MeV, 100% polarization with rates of thousands per, thousands per second up to millions per second per square centimeter. And the, yeah, the reason why there are only a few facilities is you need a strong um, proton accelerator, which is a quite expensive machine, not only the energy, but also a relatively high current. And good news for the Muon Science is there are now two projects more or less approved. There's the Music a project which provides a second Muon facility in Japan, in Osaka, with the DC Muon beam. And just four weeks ago, uh, the Muon project at the CSNS in China got its first uh, we yeah, are Muon facility approved that they can start to set up a facility there. There are more projects in South Korea and in the United States at the SNS, but there it's lot less clear if there will be Muon beams in the future. So for the generation of Muon beams, yeah, you, you start with, um, with protons, you generate the pine beam and the traditional way how it was done in the 1960s, 1970s, you first select pions and let them decay in flight into the muon beam. And uh, so therefore the, the, the muon takes the kinetic energy of the pion, and which means so typically the muon momenta of our tens of MeV over C, which corresponds to about 20 MeV up to 80 or 100 MeV uh, kinetic energy. And um, these beams are used if you have to penetrate with a muon beam a thick material, for example, like in pressure cells. We will see an example later. But uh, the polarization of these beams is only 80%. If you want to have uh, higher stopping density, you are using what is called today the surface muons. These are muons which are generated by pions stopping at the, s uh, the surface of the production target, which is typically graphite and then you select these uh, um, muons which have um, this 4.1 MeV and they have a much higher stopping density so they stop within 100 micrometer or a few hundred micrometer 
whereas uh, the, these MEV beams stop in centimeters. And um, a relatively new development uh, in the past 20 years was the generation of low energy muon beams in the kilo electron volt range. I will just present here the method that we are using at PSI. Um, this is just using a proper moderator to convert these four MeV, uh, four mega electron volt beams into an electron volt beam. So you might think, what is the problem? You just put a foil, some material into the beam, you degrade the beam, you slow it down, but what you typically get is a very broad distribution um, with a peak at a few hundred kV. You can make it thicker, the peak shifts to lower energies, but it's getting broader and broader. And these black dots, this is meonium coming out of neutral um, um, atom where the positive muons captures an electron and form a hydrogen-like meonium state. It, it's in this killer electron volt range where you get more and more muonium, so this is completely useless to make a low energy muon beam. But thanks to some ideas from positron moderation in the 1980s, um, there was the idea to try a solid rare gas film, and this is now what we are also doing at, at PSI. We have a cold silver substrate, cool it down to 10 Kelvin, 6 Kelvin, and we deposit a few hundred nanometer thin layer of a solid argon or solid neon uh, film. And if you measure the energy spectrum of the particles coming out, you see this very nice peak in the spectrum at between 10, 20, 30 eV. So we are using these muons. We apply up to 20 kilovolts to this uh, foil and re-accelerate them to the kilo electron volt range. The problem with this uh, process is that you see here, this is the moderation efficiency, so the number of slow muons per incoming muons as a function of the thickness of the layer. So we have here the argon uh, dependence, and this is the for neon. It's a bit better working than argon, and you see that this gives you uh, the typical depth from where you can get these low energy muons, and this is about 100 nanometer. So your active volume of your target is about 100 nanometer, and this, if you compare it with this red line here, this shows the stopping distribution width of the incoming beam, and the width is typically 100 micrometer. So the overall scale of this moderation efficiency is just given by this escape depth divided by the width of the incoming beam, and this gives you already 10 to the minus 3, and then there are some other losses. So you have only a moderation efficiency of 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 5. If you want to have thousands of muons per second, you have to start with a very intense muon beam, more than 100 million muons per second. And for this, you need a megawatt proton uh, beam, typically. And therefore, this is only available at the moment at PSI, where we have a megawatt proton beam, and JPARC is on the way to that. So we can generate some 10, 13, 15,000 low energy muons per second uh, with our low energy uh, uh, muon beam set up at PSI. <laughs> So this gives you an overview about uh, the range. So we see here the, um, the, the muon beams which are available at all the muon facilities from the surface muons up to the decay surface, uh, yeah, decay <coughs> beams. You see here the range from micrometer to centimeters. And the low energy muons in the kilo electron range, this is in the nanometer, uh, from a few nanometer up to two, three hundred nanometers. So this allows you to apply low energy uh, muons are to um, thin film studies and heterostructures and other very interesting things. So this we have uh, here and today already, the muon is a local magnetic probe, so it stops somewhere in, in, the, in the unit cell of your sample and it probes the local magnetism in this unit cell. As we heard, in most of the cases, it does not affect or um, stimulate any um, weird things here, so it's, it measures the intrinsic properties. In, in, in semiconductors, typically one measures uh, the field distribution in the vortex state. From this you can get important information about the penetration depth and order, superconducting order parameters. And uh, some more rare cases where you use the meonium state. I will have in my contributed talk afterwards an example where we use the meonium atom as a sensor for charge carriers at the surface of germanium. Uh, wafers, for example, but this is for yeah, it's to study hydrogen states in semiconductors and insulators, but also to do chemistry, radical formation, molecular dynamics, or chemical reaction kinetics, you can use this meonium atom. So this we have he seen already some general marks uh, where, where muons are used mainly, so it's a pro to, to probe static magnetism. Uh, to, to determine the magnetic homogeneity of the sample, temperature dependence of the magnetic order of the, uh, parameter, but also we can see the um, dynamics, magnetic fluctuations, especially uh, close to 
magnetic phase transitions. In, uh, if you use uh, so-called transverse field measurements where you have the precession around the applied field, this is also done in magnetism to measure night shifts, again, homogeneity of the sample. And in superconductors, you can, from the vortex state um, analysis, you can get coherence length vortex structure and, and so on. So this is a main field of uh, applications. <coughs> and to compare it with some other techniques, scattering techniques, uh, MUSR is a local probe. It does not average uh, across your, your sample. And it's one of the strengths is that it's um, very well suited to investigate magnet magnetically inhomogeneous samples, where eventually with scattering techniques you don't see anything Whereas with the muons, you can see eventually the competing interactions between different magnetic orders, also the coexistence between magnetic and uh, magnetism and superconductivity, which you hardly can see with these scattering techniques. And uh, yeah, this uh, we have seen in the previous talk, uh, the time window for fluctuations of muons are, it, it, it fills the gap between NMR and these more classical methods and neutron scattering or MOSPA, which are much, much faster. So the instrumentation that we have at our facility, this gives an overview of the facility. So we have here a three-stage proton accelerator, first stage, second stage, the main cyclotron, which generates a proton beam up to 2.4 milliamps at 600 MeV, which is a beam power of 1.3, 1.4 megawatts, so the most powerful proton beam in the world still. And this high-intensity beam is sent to a first muon production target and the second one you see uh, these beam lines where you have uh, dipole and quadrupole magnets to transport the beam, to select the beam momentum or beam energy. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, six instruments which are all permanently um, installed. They are for, for different purposes. Uh, most of them use these, these 4 MeV um, surf so-called surface muons where you can s uh, probe samples up to a few hundred micrometer depth. Uh, we have one, B, uh, one instrument using the decay muons for penetrating into pressure cells, for example. I will show you this uh, a bit later. And uh, a very high field spectrometer, which is unique in the world. This um, high intensity, high pressure, oh, high energy, high pressure uh, um, instrument is also unique. And then here, the, the low energy muon facility, also a unique instrument in the world. So why do you have different instruments? Well, for different applications, for different purposes. If you want to use pressure cells where you have to uh, pressure cells, there, there's a picture. Um, here you can go up to three gigapascal, which is about 30 kilobar. And there the pressure cell, you need a wall of about one centimeter that it does not explode. So the muons first have to penetrate this uh, pressure cell. And for this, yeah, you use uh, these decay muons. So you uh, select first pions from the production target and let them decay in a superconducting solenoid and then you select the muon momentum and bring it to your experiment. And um, yeah, this is a quite interesting. Usually um, you want to, to drive your system either by, by chemically doping or by, by some external means to, to through a uh, phase transition and want to study how this uh, happens. And do it by chemical doping, of course, you need several samples. This is some, something where you can in situ, you change uh, your um, system by, by changing the, the lattice um, um, dimensions and you can drive um, the system through so-called quantum critical points from a, from a magnetic state to superconducting state and all these things. So this is a very uh, topical field of applications at the moment. So then one, um, the, the workhorse of the facility, it's uh, using the surface muons with a range of a few hundred micrometer. Uh, this was designed for having very rapid turnover, so a sample is changed within a few minutes. It has a very versatile in sample environment, very broad uh, temperature range, and one can measure very small samples. We see here set up uh, how the detector, the positron detectors are surrounding the sample. The sample sits here in the center. So you have um, the incoming muon beam. If it misses the sample, it will fly into some so-called V2 detector. So you can make the sample very small. And with the, uh, let's say, the logic of your detection system, you can reject all the events where the sample was uh, missed. So this is, f especially for very small single crystal measurements, this is very um, a good advantage. And there's another instrument which is more for doing some 
external stimuli test like applying electric field or what we have seen this morning in, in the talk uh, by Sarkar, there, there is a collaboration actually initiated by the uh, people from Dresden University and the Max Planck in, uh, Institute in Dresden where you have this strain device where you uh, can apply in situ uniaxial strain to, to change uh, the parameters or to change the properties of your sample. And um, there is, uh, for very low temperatures and very high fields, this is again interesting for quantum critical point, flux line lattice in, in superconductors. And there you need a very good time resolution to be able to measure the muon spin precession at these high uh, fields. And uh, there is a very special detection system with 50 picosecond second time resolution which allows you to measure very high detection frequencies. And then this, uh, I mentioned already, the low energy muon instrument where we have about uh, 1,500 muons per second per square centimeter. There's a project at J-Park where they don't use this simple moderation technique. They use, uh, they first form ionium in vacuum and then they do a two-step um, laser ionization, but it's very complicated and they have difficulties with the laser uh, power. So therefore, at the moment, they have much lower uh, beam um, intensities. So therefore, they don't have yet a uh, user facility open. And uh, yeah, this is a sketch of this low energy uh, muon facility. We have here the moderator, where we have more than 200 million muons per second hitting the moderator. And then by an electrostatic transport system, we bring the muons to the sample, where we have about 5,000 per second. Relatively large beam spot, because the phase space of the beam at the beginning is already quite large. And then there's a detector, which further blows up the phase space, which makes the focusing a bit more difficult. There's a new instrument, um, there, it will replace an old one, the low temperature facility, which was actually the first MUSR facility instrument in the 1980s. Uh, this now um, is decommissioned and dismantled, and this new flame instrument should be in operation in, in, in 2020. And it's also designed for having a, a smaller, uh, faster sample change in a dilution refrigerator, so to, to be able to go down to 10 millikelvin and have a, a relatively quick turnover from one experiment to the next one. Some numbers um, of the facility, so we have uh, six state-of-the-art instruments, three of them are unique, this high pressure, high field and low energy immune uh, instrument. Um, in a typical year where we have the accelerator running from May to December, we have about 190 beam days with a relatively high av availability, 90 to 95% of this accelerator, which is very good. These are the instrument days. We have between 200 and 230 proposals submitted every year. So there's quite a high overbooking between two and four, so the average is 2.5. So in order to get um, beam time there, you have to have a very good case and write a good proposal. We have some 170 users um, coming to the facility every year producing 60 publications and 10 in high impact journals. And uh, this is uh, the team, um, the staff members, but we have also a few PhDs and postdocs. And with a final slide, I'd like to thank my colleagues from which I borrowed the slides and I thank you for your attention. Yeah. I think Thomas Prokshaw will give in our talk. Yeah, just, just after this one. Yeah, oop.